All right, can you all see that okay? Yes. Beautiful, okay. Um, so welcome to the Virtual Application Assistance Day. Um, some quick kind of housekeeping notes, please keep your microphone muted uh, throughout the entirety of the presentation uh, so that we can hear the attendees when they're speaking. Um, if you have questions, we'd love to hear them, just pop them in the chat. Uh, don't be shy, we'll be monitoring that as we go. Um, and we'll also have time for questions at the end. Um, if you need closed captions, those can be turned on at the bottom of the screen with the button that says uh, live transcripts. Um, at the end of the event, we'll post a survey in the chat. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback about uh, this event and how it was for you. Um, we're always trying to improve for next year, so that's super helpful. Uh, so a little bit about Craft Lake City. Um, our mission is to educate, promote, and inspire local artisans while elevating the creative culture of the Utah arts community through science, technology, and art. Um, and the way that we do that is through our year-round programming, which includes our makers markets. Uh, we have a big festival in the summer, uh, which is what you're here today to apply for. Um, that's our annual DIY fest. Um, and that one happens at the Utah State Fair Park in Salt Lake City in August. And then we also have our holiday market, which happens in Ogden in early December. Um, another thing that we do to kind of pursue our mission is our year-round DIY workshop programming. So we offer um, accessibly priced craft workshops to the community. Um, some of the upcoming classes we have right now are punch needle coasters, uh, printmaking, all ages puppet making, moss terrariums, and so much more. So we like try and have a very wide range of craft workshops that we offer. Um, and they are all taught by local artisans from the community. Uh, we also do virtual programming. Um, we have this past year done um, live streaming virtual craft workshops, as well as um, online craft workshops that are like available for purchase and you can uh, complete on your own time. Uh, we also offered a STEM Kids online workshop, which was a partnership with Google Fiber uh, that we offered um, a six part series uh, to help Utah elementary schools with their remote learning efforts. Um, another thing that we do is a uh, local curation project. So this offers an opportunity for us to work with local artisans uh, to promote their work through these um, billboards that we uh, curate year round. Um, they're located on Broadway between 200 East and 200 West. They're free to the public, open 24 seven, and you can always go and see local art there. Um, we have kind of two curation projects, Celebration of the Hand, which is uh, with local artisans, and then Local Voices, where we partner with uh, organizations to kind of provide a platform for them to get the, their word out there about their organizations. Um, cur currently, we have a really cool exhibition happening called uh, Faces of Creativity. That is actually uh, 14 artisans who are past participants in our DOI Fest. And they all um, did self-portraits in the Craft Lake City colors. Um, and that's kind of to help us promote DIY has called for entries and um, just the event in general. Okay, I'm gonna pass it off to Liz here to talk about uh, the DIY Fest. Cool, well, thanks Morgana. Uh, just a quick int introduction. My name is Liz Vowles. I'm the Artisan and Programs Manager for Craft Lake City. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to be chatting about the call for entries for DIY Fest, which is happening now. Um, here are a couple important dates for everybody to keep in mind uh, as we're thinking about applying. Um, so today, right now, is our virtual application assistance day. Um, and this will be posted online uh, for folks who are not able to tune in live. So you can still get the information and help taking your photographs. Uh, we're also doing an in-person application assistance day event um, at Essential Photo Supply, uh, which is happening on March 20th. 29th uh, in the afternoon. And this is an opportunity for anybody who would like professional quality product photos uh, for free um, to come in and get that photo session, learn some great photo tips uh, to best represent your work. Um, and then Craft Lake City staffers will also be on hand to answer any questions about the call for entries. Um, we can do a walkthrough of the application itself. 
Um, so yeah, even if you're if you're here today or you're watching it online, um, you can still definitely benefit from visiting us at the in-person session uh, with Essential Photo Supply. Um, moving forward to April 3rd uh, at 11.59 p.m. MST, this is when applications close for the DIY Fest. So it is right around the corner, so don't wait. Um, you can always reach out to us with questions before then, but the sooner you get your application done, the better. Um, jumping forward to May 2nd, um, this is when we will have our participation um, uh, list announced um, and any scholarship applications um, that may have come in, you will also receive notifications um, as to, yeah, whether, whether you've received the scholarship opportunity. Uh, May 15th is when uh, exhibitor fees are due for any of our accepted exhibitors. And then um, jumping forward to August uh, 12th, 13th, and 14th, that is the DIY Fest itself. Uh, and we do have options for um, participants who are interested in being part of it, but not for all three days. Um, so you don't have to commit to all three. That's part of the application that we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, and Britt has asked what time on the 29th is the in-person application assistance day? That's a really good question. I'm pretty sure it's 6 to 8 p.m. Um, I can check on that right now, though. Yeah. Let me see. The 29th. Um, oh. Yep, 6 to 8 p.m. And uh, just for reference, Essential Photo Supply is located in downtown Salt Lake City. So they're really close to the Craft Lake City headquarters. Um, so to talk briefly about some of our diversity and inclusion initiatives, um, we have a, a few different things that we do to help increase our um, yeah, our participation and accessibility for these events. Uh, the first of which is application assistance days, which we're doing right now. Um, we also offer application fee support. Uh, we have a sponsored entrepreneur program, um, sponsored families program at the DIY Fest, um, and then scholarship options as well. So we'll dive into some of the details here now for each of those. So application assistance days, um, as mentioned, these are free and open to anybody in the community who would like assistance with the application process. Um, we will provide a full walkthrough of the application itself, um, both today during this session and then in the in-person. Um, you will receive a product photo tutorial from Essential Photo Supply from Matt, who's on the call with us today. Um, and then for the in-person event on March 29th, uh, a free product photo session um, for folks who visit in person at Essential Photo Supply. Um, and then with the photos that you receive for the in-person session, you're free to use those for whatever purposes that you would like, um, but we will digitize them and um, send them over in a timely manner so that you can use them for your application. As far as application fee support goes, um, we offer assistance for creatives who are interested in applying for DIY Fest, uh, but for whom the application fee itself might provide a, or present a barrier to entry. Uh, it is a one-time application fee of $20, um, but if this is a barrier for you, please reach out to us uh, for more information um, at info at craftlakecity.com. We have a, a limited number of application fee waivers that we can provide um, from uh, grant money and individual donors. Um, sponsored Entrepreneurs, this is a really cool program that we have at DIY Fest uh, for first time applicants who uh, are interested in learning more about the DIY Fest and kind of what it takes to be an exhibitor at a large scale market like that um, without committing to um, actually having a booth just yet. Um, so sponsored entrepreneurs receive mentorship from a seasoned entrepreneur uh, or DIY Fest participant. Um, they receive custom tailored business guidance uh, based on the products that they make or the business that they run. Um, and then preparation for the artisan and scholarship and mentor program. Um, and you do have to be a first time applicant uh, to DIY Fest to qualify. Um, we also have our sponsored families program as part of our diversity and inclusion initiatives. Uh, and this is to provide a full festival experience to first time DIY Fest attendees attendees uh, from underrepresented and or socially or economically excluded communities. Uh, and those are for whom uh, their household income fall below 50% of the uh, medium for their county of residence. Um, and these families, in order to receive that full fest experience, uh, receive DIY fest tickets, food vouchers, uh, and Craft Lake City merchandise. 
Um, going into some scholarship opportunities, uh, we have a few wonderful scholarships uh, available this year for DIY Fest. Uh, we have scholarships every year, um, but we're always looking for new avenues uh, to offer uh, fee waivers and mentorship for our prospective uh, applicants. So we have actually a brand new scholarship this year. Um, the first of which, this is kind of our recurring one, the Artisan Scholarship and Mentor Program. This is uh, for first time DIY Fest participants uh, in the artisan, vintage, or craft food categories. Um, this involves both waived booth fees um, for participation in the festival, as well as that custom tailored business um, mentorship from a seasoned DIY Fest exhibitor. Um, so they help um, before the festival to consult about uh, product preparation, branding, merchandising. Um, they're there for on-site support uh, to provide just that, that pep squad um, and to answer questions on site while at the DIY Fest and then for wrap up um, afterwards, assisting with um, things like tax forms um, just to give business guidance there and um, yeah, to make sure that you have a really great fest experience. And we have uh, five artisan scholarship and mentor program um, opportunities. So five first time DIY Fest participants in those categories are um, eligible. We also offer a STEM scholarship, which is custom tailored to the needs of each um, STEM exhibitor who is interested. Um, so if you are a STEM person, please reach out to us. Um, we are very excited to hear about your project and to see if there's a way that Craft Lake City can um, support you with your booth fees. Uh, we have Kid Row scholarships as well. So for our youth entrepreneurs um, at DIY Fest, um, this is waived booth fees um, for a select number of Kid Row applicants. And then new this year, we have our Project Rainbow Scholarship, which uh, we're partnering with Project Rainbow to um, waive booth fees for five um, artisans whose work um, amplifies LGBTQ plus visibility. Um, and this is applicable to not only first time participants, but also um, returning uh, folks who have done DIY Fest or Holiday Market with us before. Um, so why, why should you apply to exhibit at the DIY Fest? There are a lot of great reasons. Um, exposure is a huge one. Um, the DIY Fest is the biggest local centric makers market in the whole state of Utah. So this is an amazing chance to uh, gain huge exposure to uh, a network of very dedicated local patrons of the arts. Um, networking is huge as well. Um, with it being such a big event, we have over 300 different exhibitors. Um, so it's a great chance to meet people who are doing really cool things, uh, who have a lot of um, interesting experience doing um, arts and um, other similar topics. Um, so yeah, great way to make friends and to learn from some some great people who have done it before, um, who are maybe also doing it for the first time, who are just really passionate about uh, arts and crafts and STEM. Um, feedback. Um, this is, yeah, just being at DIY Fest is a great chance to get direct feedback from uh, local people who are viewing your work, who are purchasing your work to see um, what, what folks like and maybe some areas uh, for improvement. It's a great chance to get a lot of commissions too. Um, this is a huge one. You know, a lot of people will visit the DIY Fest and will maybe make a purchase in the moment or might wait a little bit, but um, will message, um, you know, after the fact, um, great opportunity to brand yourself with your business card and contact information for people to contact you after the fact to do custom work. Um, Invitations. Uh, this is a, a, another chance to learn about other local makers markets and um, curation projects and opportunities in the greater Salt Lake area um, from attendees and also from other um, participants. Um, growth. Great chance to make money, great chance to grow your business and to maybe even test drive some new products that you've um, been thinking about um, but haven't quite launched yet. And all in all, it is a really fun experience. I can safely say that having been somebody who exhibited at DIY Fest twice myself. It's a lot of fun. Um, and if you don't wanna take our word for it, here's a couple quotes from um, exhibitor surveys from the past couple of years of DIY Fest. Um, this festival has over the last several years taught me to be better at pop-up shows, which has led to an increase in revenue. It also helped me up my game in photographing my work to list online for an Etsy shop, as well as connecting with other artists that have shared tips and knowledge around marketing and social media strategies. I've learned to raise the bar a bit higher every year in my expectations from the income that I get from my work and my business, and it has become my absolute favorite event of the year. 
Uh, another anonymous participant writes, uh, it was very well organized and planned. I got a lot of FaceTime with people to get my name out. I had a steady flow, a very steady flow of people and was able to pass out my cards and information to help me get my name out there more. And back to you, Morgana. All right, uh, so before you apply to the DIY Fest, we're gonna go over some of the specifics. Um, eligibility, so um, to be eligible to apply as an exhibitor, um, you, you um, are in one of these categories. So a creative maker, a foodie, a performer, a multicultural group, a STEM exhibitor, youth entrepreneur, or local organization slash nonprofit. So those are the main categories that we focus on. Um, you reside and operate in Utah. It's like very important to us uh, to elevate the local culture. So um, we focus on promoting uh, Utah locals. Um, your work is original, handcrafted, and made by yourself. So um, this is another thing is we uh, really focus on promoting handmade items and uh, folks who do original work. Uh, so the images and information in your application must represent products that will be sold at the DIY Fest. Um, this is important because it gives us like a good sense of uh, what you'll actually be selling and we'll be able to kind of, um, our jurors will be able to kind of go through um, your products in a authentic, accurate way. Um, and the last thing is to make sure you submit your application and pay the application fee by the deadline, um, which is April 3rd. All right, and then um, we'll just briefly go over the participation fees. Um, these do range a lot depending on uh, space size, exhibitor type, and number of days participating. We do have like a full breakdown of these on our website. Um, but to give you kind of an idea of the range, um, for artisan and craft food, uh, it's going to be between $89 and $678. Um, on average, folks spend around $239 to $339. And then we have an optional electricity fee of $150, um, as well as special placement, which is $300. So to kind of go over what those are, um, Electricity at the venue is like very limited. So if you need electricity for your booth for any reason, um, we have to pay that or have to offer that premium fee so that um, we just don't have everybody using the electricity and causing a blackout. Um, so that's an option. Um, special placement means that you basically work with us to um, figure out a spot on the map that uh, you want for whatever reason, maybe you want to be like next to your best friend or um, something like that. So that is also an option that we uh, offer. For Kid Row, the tabling fee is $25. Um, commercial food can be up to $1,120. Um, STEM exhibitors, it's in the range of $89 to $339. Um, and then performers are compensated for their performance. All right, so a little bit about the jury process. So um, for artisan and craft foodies, uh, those applications are juried by an anonymous panel of local professionals. Um, so we're not the ones who uh, choose those folks. We get folks from the community uh, to look at the applications um, in like an anonymous way. So they'll just have access to your five product photo images, descriptions, and prices. So. Um, thinking about that, it's very important to have uh, good quality images there, uh, which is why we have Matt here to help us with that. Um, and then commercial food vendors and STEM exhibitors, uh, youth entrepreneurs and performers, those ones we do review internally. All right, so we are going to go through the application. Um, so I'm gonna navigate us around the website. See if I can. All right, and can you all see that uh, web page, the Craft Lake City landing page? Yes, I can. Awesome. Okay, so this is the um, landing page of Craft Lake City, um, and you can see right at the front here. There's a way to click and apply for your um, 
for the DIY Fest. So we have several ways that we can kind of navigate that. Um, we can click on this pop-up here. We also have this drop down over here for the DIY Fest. Um, so I'm going to just click here and this will take us to the landing page uh, for the DIY Fest. So we have a big apply here button followed by some important info. What is the DIY Fest? Um, what it means to be kind of part of the DIY Fest? Um, some important dates and deadlines, as well as the location and time of the actual event. And then if we scroll down, we have um, kind of rules and regulations for each category. Um, so if we clicked on, let's say, artisan and vintage vendors, this would take us to this big uh, prospectus page where you could review eligibility, um, original work regulations, um, application fees, all the categories. Um, we have a breakdown of the exhibitor space info and all those fees listed out by um, price and category. Uh, lots of helpful info here, space sharing policy about electricity, um, special placement goes more into depth into that. Um, yeah, so this is definitely a, a useful resource. And then from this page, you can also navigate to your application. Um, and you can either uh, select which category you are up at the top here, and then it'll just take you right to it. Um, or you can just scroll through. Um, the other way to kind of get to the different categories is by coming back to this page. And then if you select, let's say, uh, performers, it'll just jump you straight to the performer prospectus. All right. So um, below that, we have some FAQ for exhibitors. So some frequently asked questions. These are just uh, the top ones that we get asked the most. And then you can navigate to a full list of frequently asked questions here. Lots of helpful info in there. Um, and then this is frequently asked questions for festival attendees. All right, so we are going to start an application. So if I hit apply here, it takes me to this application page. Um, down below, we have some links that uh, connect us to some scholarships, uh, back to the prospectus here that we were just looking at. And then if we hit uh, get started now, you'll be able to in this window, select which type of vendor you are. So uh, artisan and vintage vendor, uh, craft food vendor, which are folks who make prepackaged edible goods, uh, DIY engineer, STEM exhibitor, um, or tinkerer, those kinds of things, anything related to uh, STEM. And we host those folks specifically in the Google Fiber STEM building. Um, performer, kid row application, so those are uh, artisans ages 14 and under. Commercial food vendor. Um, this is like food trucks, food stalls, folks who make large quantities of food on site uh, as opposed to prepackaged and they bring it to sell. Um, and then down here, you would create your login credentials. Um, I already have those set up. So I'm just gonna go back and log in here. Oops. All right, so once I log in, this brings me to this page here. Um, do you have any questions at this point? I feel like the chat might be. Oh, great, you're on that list, perfect. Yep, I did wanna mention though, that if we have anybody tuning in for this application assistance day, who's um, planning on applying for the DIY Fest this year, but they've either applied or participated in past years, you do need to create a new uh, login for each new year. It doesn't save your information from last time. Yeah, thank you so much. That is definitely a question we get a lot. Um, okay, so 
we are in our application now and I am going to start the first step here. So the modules that are incomplete will be in red and we'll give the uh, status. So we're gonna go to our information and I'm gonna put in my name. This actually has it from when I was testing this application, so it's kind of perfect. Um, yeah, so name, preferred pronouns, uh, your business name. Um, I know some folks like don't really have a business name, which is totally fine. Like I could just put like Morgana Fay Art and that's totally good enough. Um, so this is your bio. So this is kind of like a, a tweet style, very short, uh, 280 characters or less. Uh, biography of kind of what you make. So um, we have an example here, uh, a lifelong lover of fiber, Jill creates macrame masterpieces knotted by hand. Her current work focuses on wall hangings, plant holders, and other woven wonders that add an element of delight and surprise to your living space. I'm going to just copy and use this for the sake of time. Um, so this is where you can put uh, your website, Facebook page URL, Twitter handle, Instagram handle, uh, TikTok handle, and as you can see, these are all um, not required. So if you don't have any of these, it's totally fine. Um, say I just have an Instagram handle. Personal information. So um, this is so that we can I uh, contact you if we need to and uh, send you your sales tax form. So um, put in your phone number. It's from a different application. If you have an alternate phone number, you can use that. Email address. Um, and it is important to use an email address or actually this one specifically is specifically for sales tax. So, um, but use your login email as um, an email address that you check often because we do sometimes send uh, info to that or when you're accepted or not, we'll send uh, the response to that. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna put in my street address. Uh, mailing address for tickets. So we offer, um, accepted exhibitors some uh, tickets to the festival to help out with um, managing your booth. So uh, make sure this is an address where you'll be able to get mail. So I'll save and continue here. All right, additional information. So this is where you would select uh, the category that you in. So for an artisan application, uh, these are the categories. They look very similar for a kid row application. Um, craft food is going to look slightly different. Performer is going to look slightly different. Um, and yeah, STEM exhibitor is going to look slightly different. So just uh, try and select the category that kind of best represents you. Um, so let's say I make jewelry. All right, and a secondary category that represents your work if applicable. Um, so let's say I just make jewelry strictly. So I don't have to necessarily answer this. It's, um, this one is optional. So then this question, are all of your products handmade? Uh, please explain any non-handmade aspects of your item. So this kind of falls in line with um, eligibility of uh, we highlight artisans whose work is handmade. So um, if there's anything about your work that isn't handmade, uh, we'd like to know kind of up front um, and kind of uh, look at that on a case by case basis when we're drawing applicants. Um, so I'll say All right, and then I can select if it's my first time applying or not. Uh, let's say yes, my first time applying. Have you participated in the Craft Lake City DIY Festival in the past? Uh, not yet. 
but you can select which years you have if you have. All right, so this is the exhibitor space information. Um, so this is your preference about what space you'd like to be in. Um, we have five by 10, 10 by 10, a shared 10 by 10, which would be for two artisans who wanna share both together, a world market, uh, which is 10 by 10, a collective 10 by 10, a Sunday only 10 by 10, uh, and Sunday only five by 10, and then uh, two connected spaces. So this is if you need like a very large shop. We are uh, newly this year offering a 20 by 10. Um, so let's say I am interested in um, sharing a booth with my buddy. So I will hit share 10 by 10. And then down below here, I would indicate uh, who I want to share a booth with. So let's say. We have a couple of questions in the chat right now about um, booth location and booth sharing. Um, so Britt is wondering um, if uh, for craft food applicants, if they'll be located inside this year. Um, we do offer um, like ch the choice for anybody who applies, regardless of whether you're an artisan, vintage vendor, craft food. Um, you have the choice to request indoors placement or outdoors placement. But um, given that it is so hot in August, we very, very, very strongly encourage all of our craft food vendors to um, opt for indoors placement this year. And on the craft food version of the application, we have like a little bulletin on there. Um, you know, when you go to choose your exhibitor space, like you should, you should go for indoors if you're craft food. We highly recommend it uh, just to maintain the the structural integrity of your product and make sure that it, it doesn't, you know, get um, like too damaged from the heat. Um, and then Chloe is wondering what happens if you purchase a shared booth, uh, but only one of the applicants is accepted. Um, and I think that actually segues nicely into where Morgana is um, on the app. Yeah, totally. So um, let's say I want to share a booth with Liz. So I'll put her um, business name in here. And then the next question is, if you applied to share a space with another artisan, but that space partner does not get accepted, are you still interested in exhibiting? So you'll have the option to say, um, yeah, I still totally wanna to exhibit, or um, no, I really just wanted to do it uh, with that person. So I'm not interested in exhibiting if they don't get accepted. So um, I am, Interested, so let's say yes, but I'll have a smaller space. Um, so then the next question goes into, would you prefer to have your space located indoors or outdoors? Um, as Liz was saying, it does get really hot. It's in August. Uh, so thinking about your products and how they do uh, in that temperature is gonna be important. So, um, I'm gonna say I'd like to exhibit indoors. All right, and then how many days would you like to apply for the DIY test? So uh, we do offer Friday and Saturday only participation uh, to accommodate everybody. And then we also offer just Sunday only to kind of fill those spots for people who are just able to participate in, fr in Friday and Saturday. Um, so I'm interested in participating all three days. So. I'll uh, check that. So then there's another question here about the wait list. So if you're not immediately accepted, um, but are placed on the wait list, what would I do? Um, so let's see, I would still, let's say I would still be interested in participating for the entire weekend. Um, and I would just kind of wait to hear uh, if I would be bumped up off that wait list. Um, you can do uh, all these kind of options. You can say that you'd like to be taken off the wait list because um, you're maybe not interested in kind of waiting to see what would happen. Um, so I'm gonna say I'd still be interested in participating all three days. Okay, next question. We do offer table and share rentals. Um, 
to purchase through Craft Lake City um, or to rent through Craft Lake City. So if you want to rent them instead of bringing your own, uh, you can indicate that here. Um, and then if you have any questions about accessibility, you can uh, write them out here or you can always email us or give us a call. All right, the next one is application. I do not know what this image is. <laughs> um, the next one is uh, your photo. So again, these are really important high quality images that really accurately represent your work. Um, you're gonna upload five of these. Um, and if you plan on offering like more than one type of a product, be sure to include um, images of like each type. Like if you offer prints and stickers and like enamel pins, um, then we'd love to see each of those types of products. Um, Yeah, so you um, would just go down here and upload five images. So let's start with, um, I don't actually know what this image is, but we'll just skip over that one and go to image two. So I'm just going to uh, pick a random image from a workshop to upload. So uh, let's say this product is um, an enamel pin. So I'd say enamel pin, say a uh, cute pin with a uh, baby seal, um, enamel, um, size, let's say it's like one inch tall, um, hand, maybe it's hand design, but I don't print it myself. All right, and then retail price of the product, let's say it's $4. And then you will also have an opportunity here to uh, link to this product on your web store if applicable. So if you have it listed, uh, you can link to that. All right, so I'm gonna do the same thing here. Another random photo. Um, yeah, you get the idea, I'm gonna just, kind of fill this out randomly from last time I did a test application. All right, and you do want to be mindful of making sure that the images that you're uploading are rotated before you upload them to the website. All right, and then this featured image is basically what we would use for your exhibitor profile. Um, so make sure it's something that really represents you, uh, represents your work, represents your style. Um, and another note is that it will be cropped into a square. So um, potentially looking and see if it, uh, cropping it into a square before you upload it could help you uh, see if it uh, looks good. So I'm gonna hit save images. About the um, featured image too, sometimes people will choose their logo for the featured image. This is the, the sort of thumbnail that it, people who are visiting the Craft Lake City website um, will be browsing through as they're looking at the list of accepted participants. So you can sort by category, but it's um, like your, your featured image will be just next to your name and people will click on that to see all of the, the additional photos and information that you've submitted. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so uh, this next page is a 
uh, terms and conditions. So uh, go ahead and read this before you submit your application. Um, and then you'll be able to uh, hit, I understand and accept, or uh, I don't know if you have questions about this, you can always call or email us. Um, and then you'll sign it virtually here. Um, and up here, it does say the application fee is $20. Um, for Kid Row, it's $10. Uh, but for all the other applications, it is 20. Um, and again, you can always email us at info at Craft Lake City. Uh, if that fee poses a barrier, we do have a limited number of um, application fee waivers. So I'll go ahead and sign this with my application. And then this uh, button will come up and I'll be able to pay um, via card or I think PayPal is also an option that we offer. Yeah, so that is the application. Um, I am going to close this. One other note on that, if you're not able to finish the application in one fell swoop, that's totally fine. You can log back in um, and fill out the rest of your information. It'll save your progress where you last left off. Yeah, awesome, thank you. And. Um, yeah, just a reminder that uh, the application doesn't submit on our end until you have paid that application fee. So that's the final step that you'll have to be, to be able to uh, be considered for the DIY Fest. All right, I'm gonna pass it um, over to Liz to talk about application tips. Sounds good, thank you. And I'll make this real fast so we can jump into some uh, photography uh, tips from Matt from Essential Photo Supply. So here are some things you wanna consider when you're putting together your application. Um, so for artisans and craft foodies, the third-party jury is only going to be able to see your product images, the descriptions, um, and then your prices, and then any notes about the, the description of the item, whether that's um, handmade or not. Um, so really strong emphasis there on providing high quality photos. Um, you do also want to keep in mind that there is a character limit for the um, item descriptions. Um, for performers, you'll provide links to your music um, or performance samples, um, details about your discography, and uh, notes about any experience that you have performing for large crowds. Um, so that's the type of information that is going to be most important when filling out the app. Um, for STEM exhibitors, you do have to indicate your subcategory, whether you're a business STEM exhibitor, tinkerer, um, engineer, et cetera. Um, any hands-on components of the display that you would like to bring to DIY Fest, details about that. And then um, just notes about the project itself. Um, for Kid Row, um, the application is very similar to that of artisans and foodies. Uh, so again, you want to really focus on the high quality images, um, but then also provide details about what elements of their work are handmade by the youth entrepreneur versus areas that maybe they get help from their parent or guardian. Um, your online exhibitor profile, this is what um, prospective attendees will be looking at um, as they're, you know, getting excited for DIY Fest or maybe in the days and weeks or months thereafter. Um, maybe they attended and they saw something that they liked um, or just want to revisit who, uh, who was there at DIY Fest. Uh, the online exhibitor profile is basically your bio and your photos that are public facing. Um, so all DIY Fest participants, regardless of your category, will have a profile on our website, um, including the profile picture, which is that header image, um, your bio, any links to an online store, your social media, um, and the five product photos with the descriptions, prices, and if you would like to include them, any direct links for purchase. Um, and if accepted to the DIY Fest, you actually have the ability to make updates to your exhibitor profile. Um, details on how to do that will be included in the acceptance emails. Um, so things to consider for this public facing um, uh, profile that you're building in your application, um, you want to take into consideration how you want your business to be identified. So your business name, is it your personal name like Morgana Fay Art, or are we going for a business name like The Land of Salts? Um, what is your brand? Uh, how are you going to portray the personality of your company or of your, um, your business? Um, you want to provide a short branded description um, about who you are, what you make, and why it matters. Um, so that it's really clear to people looking at our website um, why, why they should support you. 
Um, and then if you haven't already, this is a great chance to consider establishing an online presence. So um, an Instagram account, uh, Facebook, Twitter, um, a website or like an online shop, um, any public facing contact info is really helpful to include here, um, especially for people who are wanting to purchase from you who maybe um, were on the fence about it during DIY Fest. Um, having this information on your application will make it really easy for them to find you and contact you um, after the event wraps up. Um, thinking about the jurors, so what you want to include in your application um, here, again, focus on photo quality. Um, the better your photos, um, the better your work is going to look. Um, so you want to pick the five best examples of the types of products that you would exhibit or sell at the DIY Fest. Um, and like Morgana mentioned, if you're going to be exhibiting a range of products, make sure that that is represented in the photos that you submit. Um, keep your descriptions engaging and brief. Um, including any pertinent information about the medium, size, object type, etc. Um, you'll be asked about any handmade components of the work, uh, especially for things that are partially manufactured but maybe designed in-house. You'll definitely want to make sure that you uh, elaborate on any situations like that. Um, and then for pricing, this is a very personal uh, topic, but you do want to strive to find a balance of prices that are not too high, um, so they're still accessible, uh, but not too low so that you're, you know, not underselling yourself. Um, and if you're unsure about how to price your items, maybe this is the first time that you've um, applied for a market, or this will be the first time that you're selling your wares, um, we recommend researching prices for similar products by other makers. And now we hand it off to Matt Morgan from Essential Photo Supply to do a brief presentation about how to best photograph your um, items or work. Liz, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be able to share with you some of the things that I think will allow you to take amazing photos of your products uh, and to show off uh, your, uh, your product in the very best light on your application. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Oh, I think I might need permission to do that. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's see. And well, while they're looking at that, I'll talk about a couple things. I just shared my email address in the chat. I am always open to any uh, questions that you might have. Please feel free to reach out to me and let me know if you need anything. Um, uh, my email address is there, and uh, if you uh, you can get a hold of Liz or or you know Morgana or whoever, they'll be able to get in touch with me as well. Um, the second thing is, please ask questions. Even during while I'm talking, if you have a question, type it in, uh, and then I will be more than happy to answer it in line as we go along. So let's see. This. All right, I made you a co-host, so you should be able to do it oh, now. What's it doing? Oh, hold on. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I have to give I have to give Zoom permission to use my screen. Stand by. Oh. So I may it's at telling me I might need to quit and reopen Zoom in order to let it use my screen. So can I leave and come right back? We can do some Q&A in between then. Okay, I'll do that real quick. Sounds good. Um, so we got a question um, actually about indoors placement versus outdoors placement. Um, so, you know, with this being a kind of a hybrid layout uh, for the festival, like what are some reasons that people might want to be placed indoors versus outdoors? Um, and so with this being such a, a big event uh, with over 300 exhibitors, um, we have options for both. Um, to accommodate lots of different participant types and comfortability levels. Um, as mentioned, um, with Brit being a craft food vendor, um, anybody who does craft food, um, we would strongly recommend uh, opting for indoors placement because uh, then you're, you know, you're in a shaded area, you have that air conditioning. Um, for something perishable like food that is really impacted by the heat, that's definitely a consideration I want to take into account. Um, anybody who is uh, just generally heat sensitive, um, you know, we have that indoor option for you. Anybody who has products that are maybe melty, like body care or candles, things like that, um, 
indoors would probably be the, the way to go. Um, but we have so many great outdoor spots um, and the vibe out there is totally different. It really feels like, like a festival environment because we have um, live music on the Slug Mag and KRCL stages. Uh, we have our food trucks out there, a lot of um, just footfall people, um, you know, eating, playing around in the kids area. We have a dog park outside. Um, so that festival vibe is really, really strong outdoors. Um, outdoors participants do need to bring their own tent. Um, so that is a consideration to make, but, um, yeah, if you're, if you're wanting to be part of like that kind of like food and music ambiance, um, outdoors is a great option for you. Awesome. Thank you, Liz. All right. So we've got Matt back in here. I'm back and it looks like it'll work. Awesome. Oh. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and, um, let's go here. Okay, we are ready. Uh, a couple of things that I want to share with you as I get started. Um, so uh, I've got in the title here, quick tips for phone photography. Uh, obviously, these principles apply to cameras if you have a camera. Uh, any of these principles will apply for a camera. The second thing is I'm catering all of my um, tips and tricks here towards creating great photos of your product for the application. Now, uh, some of the things that I say may not apply to something you would put on a website or to market your product in other ways, uh, but I feel like this is the best way to get your product in front of the judges in the very best way. So uh, we're going to begin. Ansel Adams said, you don't take a photograph, you make it. And, uh, and so what I want to do today is walk you through a process of how you can make great photographs. And in order to do that, there's gonna be four different things we're gonna talk about. Uh, light is number one, location and background uh, is number two, composition is number three, and the final will be to know your equipment. Um, I cannot see the, ch I can't see the chat. Maybe I can if I go up here, stand by. We don't have any new messages on there just okay. yet. That's great. Okay, I brought it up, so I've got it here. Okay, so with that being said, um, we are going to, and now my chat is covering my thing. We're gonna talk a little bit about light. So we're gonna look for light. One of the things that we want to do when we are getting ready to take photos is we wanna look for a light source. Where's our light coming from? Where are we getting the light that's gonna illuminate our products? One of the greatest ways to take photos at home is to put your product next to a window. Windows offer really great uh, diffused and soft light. And you can use a smaller window, just get a little closer. Or in this case, we have really big windows so I can be back a little bit further so my setup isn't in direct sunlight. So you wanna have this soft light and you can move your chair or your table or whatever you're using around so that you can find good light. You'll see it when, it, when, uh, when you get into some really nice light. So we can set up here at natural light or we can use light that is <clears throat> excuse me, coming from a source that we create. So if we create light, we can use uh, any kind of light source as long as they all are very similar in color. So we don't get two different colors of light coming in. So for example, these are, I believe, if you look at that picture closely, these are desk lamps with roasting pans attached as a reflector. So you can get creative. Uh, you can go to the Home Depot and you can use lights that are inexpensive uh, and we're just gonna use sheets or other materials to soften it. So I choose, I, I chose this really nice um, light coming in from the window. And so once you've established your light source and what you're going to use for light, then you're going to kind of take a look at what is, what's, what's the environment I'm going to photograph this in? What's my background going to look like? And you can choose a background that is either um, something that is um, more uh, natural, or you can do something that is um, a little bit more um, created. We'll look at that in a minute. But if you're going to use a natural background, try and use something that doesn't have a lot of pattern to it, kind of like I chose here. The bricks can be a little bit distracting to your product. So this would be something I'd be like, maybe not this picture, um, but here's a, a little trick that I can teach you to help you um, be able to use this background in a way 
that will allow you to take a better photo. So on most of your phones, you're gonna have what's called a portrait mode. And the portrait mode is gonna blur your background out. So there's the same photo in portrait mode with that background blurred out. What that does is it draws the attention directly to our product and it doesn't allow for the background to be as busy or as distracting. So if you're gonna shoot in an environment, if you're gonna shoot in your studio or in your home or in the kitchen, if you bake bread, um, one of the things you can use is this portrait mode. So you get a feel for what your environment is, but you don't have that distracting background. That's a little kind of a get to know your equipment trick. So here's the background I chose. I chose a clean background. I chose white. White is a really nice background because it looks good with everything and you can show off your product really well with a white background. We have uh, every color of the rainbow paper here and we have it in four and a half foot wide rolls or nine foot wide rolls. If you wanted to use different colors to highlight your photos, we have some paper you can come get from us. About $35 to $39 for, this, for the, the four and a half foot rolls. Uh, so here's my setup, right? All I did was I took, I actually went to Walmart and I grabbed a piece of poster board and I just put that poster board on top of the table and I used a box and I taped my, my paper to the box so that I have what's called a sweep. So I don't have a, a hard line in the back. And then um, you can use a chair um, and notice they're using window light, but they moved that chair back out of the hard light. So it's in the soft light. A uh, good example of a setup that you can use at home. Uh, or you can use uh, like uh, foam core. Foam core is a great option. It's stiff and it's able to be um, used as both your background. And if you look over, there is a, a, another piece of foam core opposite of the window used as a fill light. You can use paper or, or foam core to bounce light back into your shadow areas to make your image look nice. If you're going to create light, there are these tents and other things available, or you can make your own, like I said, out of sheets or out of um, uh, tissue paper or anything that's available. You can create these own your own little tent that gives you softer light, and then you can utilize lights from, uh, from anywhere that you might have to photograph your product. So that's kind of the setup. That's where we're going to put our product in order to take the picture. You can utilize stuff around the house. You can see this uh, cupcake um, was taken on a placemat for your food, right? So uh, you just kind of look at what goes with your product. If there's a if there's a particular background that looks great, use it. It doesn't really matter what it is, um, as long as you like the way it looks and it and it doesn't distract from your product. So the next thing we are going to look at is our composition. So now that we've found our light and we've kind of got our setup ready to go and we have our background. We need to uh, compose an image. One of the things that I recommend is to keep it simple. Um, so this is, uh, you know, like this is right in my setup with my phone. I just took a picture of this camera. Maybe I'm selling cameras at the, at the DIY Fest. Um, and, and this is my product. It's simple, it's clean, and it looks nice. Uh, it, it represents what I offer. Let's say you wanted to go for a little more fun. Um, this is uh, Ruby Snap Cookies. If you're uh, ever uh, on Third West and about Ninth South, stop in and grab a cookie. But they did something that just is the same thing, right? You could put a colored background in and you can shoot your product on something that matches and creates a pop and looks really nice. Uh, another way you can do it is to do a two-tone background. Uh, just be careful that it uh, doesn't distract from your product here, the focus. So maybe portrait mode uh, brings you right to that cookie in the middle. So kind of going back to some of the previous things we learned. This is too busy. Uh, to me, this is an example of going too far, right? So this is a, a picture where maybe it works for, for your website or maybe it works for some a product package, but I feel like we really want to make sure that the, the judges know exactly what your product is. And this I feel like is another example of a nice photo, but something that might be too busy. So if you wanna use props, or you want to use something that, that accentuates your product, uh, this is a nice way to do it. This, uh, this product has um, a very, uh, a, a couple of props in there, a couple of things that kind of give you an idea of what your product might be, but it's clean and you know exactly what the product is. So I would say this is a good use of using props. Maybe you throw in a couple of uh, small items that definitely, um, that definitely uh, 
accentuate your product or might be little add-ons to your product as well. Uh, artisan baker might throw some, you know, a little pile of flour or something that is just fun that, that doesn't detract from your product. So a couple of things that I want to move on to now is um, now that we've kind of gotten into a little bit of the flow for composition, we're not quite done yet talking about composition, but I want to talk about a feature of most of our phones today, or if you have a camera, uh, zooming in, right? So if you back up just a little bit and zoom into your product, it isolates your product on the background much better than if you were using the original lens on your camera or your phone that is a wider angle lens. So on my phone, I just have an iPhone. I have this option of clicking that two times and it, and it gives me the other lens, it zooms in for me. That's a really great way to isolate your product. So knowing your, knowing your tools allows you to get closer um, with the lens and eliminate distractions. Let's say if I use the wider lens, I could see off of my paper on the sides and it was distracting. So this is a way that uses, and it also makes your products look better. So if you zoom in a little bit. So now we're gonna kind of look at different angles of our product. I recommend shooting a bunch of different angles because you never know what angle your product is gonna look best at. So if you take one and you like it, explore other options, do other photographs of that product and maybe you'll find something uh, as you photograph this that you didn't recognize was a really nice way to show off your product. So composition will also include exploring and experimenting with your product in the, in the frame, move it around, shoot from above, shoot from the side. You know, you can definitely get, sorry, I'm gonna go back this way. Um, you can definitely get better shots um, as you explore the different compositions of your product. Because we're highlighting a product, it's not, we're not going to arrange all the other things around it to make it look good. We're going to photograph the product in a way that makes it look the best. Um, and finally, um, we are going to um, be able to learn about our, our tool that we're using to capture the photo. So the last bit of the, of the puzzle that I want to talk about today is your camera. And, uh, and I'm choosing to use a phone because phones take amazing photos. You can get amazing shots for your application just with your phone. And it also incorporates a lot of tools that allow you to, to make your picture look better. All of these are applicable to cameras and software that you could get on your computer as well. And if you have questions about specific cameras and softwares, email me and I'll be happy to help you. But on our phone, we have a couple of really cool um, things that we can we can use. So, and my chat is covering this one. So my chat window is covering like the middle of my screen. So this one is, ah, HDR. So HDR is a tool. And it does say HDR up there, right? Because I can't actually see it. Yes, yes it does. Okay. Thank you. It's It's been super distracting because literally my chat window is right in the middle of my screen and I can't figure out how to close it. But anyway, it doesn't matter. HDR is a term for high dynamic range. High dynamic range means you're going to get a little more detail in the shadows and a little more detail in the highlights. Um, it's a really nice tool. Click it and it will give you a picture that looks less contrasty and more professional. So that's a tool of your camera that is on your phone that is a great tool to use. Uh, the second thing we're going to look at is the focusing square. The focusing square is um, something that tells the camera where to focus. And that seems like it would be pretty, um, you know, it, it would see your, your product in the photo and just focus on it, but it doesn't always work that way. So you can tap the screen and it will give you the correct place to, uh, it'll always focus on that spot, right? So if you want it to focus on the front of the lens or the camera in the background, you just tap that spot and it focuses there. So tapping on your screen to focus is a great tool to use. Um, being able to adjust your exposure, that little uh, sun that comes up, it's a slider. If you, if you touch it and you slide up and down, it will brighten your image. So you can make your image brighter or you could make your image darker and that will give you the opportunity to adjust in, in, uh, in camera this, uh, the exposure that you are looking for. 
the other thing that people forget about is to clean your lens. If that's been in your pocket and you've touched it with your fingers, it might give you um, uh, uh, less clear images. So you wanna be able to clean that lens so it's nice and clean. And then finally, different apps that you can use to make your photos. You're always gonna to wanna to do a little bit to your photo at the end to just make it look its best. So if you can see on the screen, um, this was the picture of the camera that I took before I uh, did any kind of adjustments to it. And so uh, on um, the left-hand side, it's just my camera roll on my, on my phone. Uh, I just tap the edit button. And then it brings me to this screen where I can adjust exposure, I can adjust color balance, I can adjust um, the, the exposure in the highlights or the shadows. It gives you a wide range of tools that you can use to make your photo look the very best. So I suggest getting in there and playing around with that. If you're already familiar with it, you know what it can do. If not, play around. It's a really good tool to use. And you can move on to apps that are apps that will be, um, will let you take the photo and edit it in the same app. Those apps are, there's a, a Lightroom or Photoshop, or there's hundreds of other photo related apps that you can download. So um, after you get to know your tool, there's nothing left but to go out and shoot. So I hope that this has been something that uh, helps you get started. Obviously there's gonna be questions and I'm available at matt at essentialphotosupply.com or I'm available, um, you can call the store um, or you can, um, uh, reach out to Liz and she can get in touch with me. So if you have any questions, shoot them over. And with that, I am, there we go. I am done. Thank you so much, Matt. That is really, really helpful and also very empowering to know that people can take high quality photos of their work um, with something as simple as a phone camera and a few tricks of the light um, and tools that you likely already have at home. Um, and then I did also just want to mention too um, that for anybody here who is interested in um, attending the in-person application assistance day, oh, my video stopped. Um, the in-person application assistance day uh, is coming up on March 29th uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, at Essential Photo Supply, which is uh, downtown Salt Lake City, uh, 959 East, 900 South. Um, we will be there to answer more of your application questions and then to also provide a free professional photo um, session for your products. Um, it looks like uh, Chloe in the chat has also suggested uh, that the trick with the desk lamp and foil uh, sounds really cool and is gonna try that out. <laughs> yeah. Um, do we have any other questions before we wrap up uh, for today? Uh, as mentioned to um, the Craft Lake City team uh, and, and Matt, we're very happy to answer questions that pop up, um, you know, anytime between now and the application deadline, uh, which again is April 3rd at 11.59 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. <laughs> and I think the next slide we have our contact information on there. Um, yep, you can reach us um, on social media at Craft Lake City. Um, our website to apply and learn more about the event is craftlakecity.com. Um, this is the number for our office. Um, we have uh, in the chat, if anybody hasn't seen it yet, we have a survey for today's uh, virtual application assistance day session. We would love any and all feedback uh, to help us improve our programming. Um, and again, uh, my name is Liz, um, Liz Vowles. Uh, we have Morgana Fay on the call and Matt Morgan. Um, you can reach us, uh, the Craft Lake City team at artisan coordinator at craftlakecity.com. You can also reach us at info at craftlakecity.com. Um, and we can always uh, help to connect you with, with Matt. Um, he's Matt at essentialphotosupply.com. Uh, big thank you to our supporters too. Um, Craft Lake City's year round programming, such as Virtual Application Assistance Day, uh, is sponsored in part by the residents of Salt Lake County through the Zoo Arts and Parks Program, the Salt Lake Arts Council the George S. and Dolores Dore Eccles Foundation and Utah Arts and Museums with funding from the state of Utah and the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, and a really huge special thank you to Essential Photo Supply uh, for making these application assistance days possible. Thank you for sharing your expertise and helping make this uh, accessible to all community members. And it looks like in the chat, we've got some thanks too. Um, thank you so much to anybody who 
uh, has attended uh, live. And thank you to any future people who are watching this later um, on our website. Please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. And I guess we wrap up. Awesome. Thanks. Everybody. Thank you all. Thank you guys very much. Awesome presentation. Thanks, Britt. We're so happy that you joined us. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Have a good day, you guys. You too. Okay. Take care. Okay, bye bye. So, Liz, did we take care of everything we needed to?